Good morning. Continuing the story of Ruth, and we are all the way up to Ruth chapter 3. And uh, the subtitle on this for this section of scripture is called Ruth and Boaz at the Threshing Floor. Now, does that have a movie title to it or what? <laughs> Ruth and Boaz at the Threshing Floor. One day, Naomi, her mother-in-law, said to her, Ruth, my daughter, should I not try to find a home for you where you will be well provided for? If not, is, is not Boaz, oh, let's back up here a second. <laughs> uh, is not Boaz with whose servant girls you have been a kinsman, have been, is he, is he not a kinsman of ours? Now, let me uh, stop a second. A kinsman was called a kinsman redeemer. And this is a person in the family that took responsibility for uh, helping those who were in need, for a whole family. So, for example, in this case, Ruth's husband died, and then her two sons died. And this kinsman redeemer, he was called, has some responsibility for her. He wants to see that she's taken care of and provided for. And they had some laws for this, and, and Pastor Dave will talk more about this next week, but they had some laws that governed this. For example, if, uh, if Ruth's husband died, then she could marry her husband's brother, and the kinsman redeemer would oversee that. Okay, you follow? And if that didn't work, there was another plan and another plan. Okay, but to take care of the widows in this case. So, continuing on. Uh, is not Boaz a kinsman of ours? Tonight, he will be winnowing barley on the threshing floor. Wash and perfume yourself and put on your best clothes. Then go down to the threshing floor, but don't let him know you are there until he has finished eating and drinking. When he lies down... Note the place where he is lying. Then go and uncover his feet and lie down. He will tell you what to do. I will do whatever you say, Ruth answered. So she went down to the threshing floor and did everything her mother-in-law told her to do. When Boaz had finished eating and drinking and was in good spirits, he went over to lie down at the far end of the grain pile. Ruth approached quietly, uncovered his feet, and lay down. In the middle of the night, something startled the man, and he turned and discovered a woman lying at his feet. Who are you, he asked, or as we said last week, who are you? <laughs> I am your servant Ruth, she said. Spread the corner of your garment over me, since you are a kinsman redeemer. Get it? Taking care of her, meeting her needs. Spread the corner of the garment over me. The Lord bless you, my daughter, he replied. This kindness is greater than that which you showed earlier. You have not run after the younger men, whether rich or poor. And now, my daughter, don't be afraid. I will do for you all you ask. All my fellow townsmen know that you are a woman of noble character. Although it is true that I am near of kin, there is a kinsman redeemer nearer than I. Stay here for the night, and in the morning, if he wants to redeem, good, let him redeem. But if he is not willing, as surely as the Lord lives, I will do it. Lie here until morning. So she lay at his feet until morning, but got up before anyone could be recognized. And he said, don't let it be known that a woman came to the threshing floor. He also said, bring me the shawl you are wearing and hold it out. And when she did so, he poured into it six measures of barley and put it on her. Then he went back to town. When Ruth came to her mother-in-law, Naomi asked, 
How did it go, my daughter? Then she told her everything Boaz had done for her and added, he gave me these six measures of barley, saying, don't go back to your mother-in-law empty-handed. Then Naomi said, wait, my daughter, until you find out what happens, for the man will not rest until this matter is settled today. Wow, what a great story, huh? Oh, can't wait for the next chapter. <laughs> but we got to work with today's chapter today. So Pastor Dave will be here in a minute. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the reality and the realness of your word. Thank you for chapters like this and books like this book in, Ro in, in Ruth where we learn of Boaz and kinsman redeemer and responsibilities for families. And Lord, we just thank you today that you give us your word as a, as a light unto our feet and a lamp unto our path. How grateful we are today to know that this word can encourage and uplift us. And as we study it under Pastor Dave today, we sense that your Holy Spirit is leading and guiding in very specific and real ways in our lives as we apply the principles of this story to our own lives. We ask this all in the strong, strong name of Jesus, our Lord and our Savior. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. Ron, hold on. Um, who are you? Tell them who you are. Some might not know. Okay, I'm Ron. Tell them no. <laughs> <laughs> I'm Ron Harris, and uh, I, uh, I've been here in the church for about eight years, I think. I'm on the board of elders, serve with the pastor, and, um, and he and I have this great relationship. I'm so grateful for him. <laughs> is that it? No. no hugging here, no. Um, this is the story of Ruth and Boaz, no, not men hugging. Well, Tell it, and Jed, I'm going to ask you to come up in a second. Wait, Ron, tell everyone how you, um, how you and Barb, how you proposed. What was the story behind oh, that Oh, my goodness. We don't have enough time. Yes. Oh, I'm starting to tear up. Short version. You know. <laughs> Is it bad? Uh, <laughs> oh, no. She says, um, she says, you know, Ron, this could go on and on. Uh, All right, I'll, I'll, I'll make it brief. Tom will cut the sound if it goes too long. <laughs> yeah. So anyhow, um, we, we were uh, famously in love. And, um, and, uh, and so uh, I, there's a, there's a, used to be a place in Minneapolis at the Radisson Hotel called the Flame Room. And the Flame Room, uh, some of you know that, okay? The Flame Room had flames, you know, torches that were on the side of it, you know, up, and, and it was all lit up with these torches and then candles on the table. And so I reserved a table for us, and, um, and uh, we went there. She had on this beautiful, beautiful blue flowing dress, and she was just gorgeous. And we sat down at this table, and I looked across there, and I thought to myself, boy, I ought to marry this girl. <laughs> and so... Uh, so I thought, well, it, she won't say yes unless I do this the right way. So I had earlier made plans. They have violinists that play, okay? There's a violin concert that's about 20 violinists, and then they go around to individual tables if you request it and pay them some money, and they play some songs. So they came around this table, the, th the three or four violinists gathered around this table, and they played... Oh, how I, oh, oh, I don't remember. <laughs> oh, I don't remember. They played, oh, I don't remember. No, they play, oh, how I danced on the night we were wed. Oh, how I danced. Okay. So, so anyhow. Shh. Did, wow. Okay. You said I could tell this story. Okay. So, so, so anyhow, how am I, how am I doing? Am I out of time yet? Horrible. Okay, so, so anyhow, so, so then I whipped out this ring right in the middle of those guys' violins playing, and, uh, and, and so ripped out this ring and, and uh, got down on one knee. No, I, I didn't do that, really. <laughs> that's, 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 I was just embellishing a little bit. But I, I got out this ring, and I asked her if she would marry me, and she couldn't even, she couldn't even say yes because she was crying so hard. Oh, is that true? So, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> she, 
She was crying so hard because she said, I don't want to say yes to this guy, but look at this. Look what he did. And, all for me. And how many years later now? So. Oh, by the way, that, she was saying, that beautiful flame room with all the flames in it, it burned down. <laughs> it did, really. So our whole thing's gone. And how long have you been married? 140 years. No, boy. No, I mean, it, it feels like. No, I mean, it's. <laughs> no, I mean, it, it doesn't feel like 140 years. Okay. 43. You're... Was it 43? 42. Oh, okay. 42 or 43 years. Yeah. Good job. Yeah. Good job. Um, hopefully she'll let you sit next to her after that. That's, thank you, Ron. Okay, you know, he, he gets up here and leads every week and does an awesome job, and you probably don't even know who he is. We, the transition was so quick. What? Like, get, I, you can yell out to Ron when he's talking, but... <laughs> what is she saying? Oh, yeah, he's going to tell you. Tell us who you are. Okay, where you're from. My formal name is Jay, J-E-Y, right? <laughs> okay. It's my great-grandmother's last name. That's why it's spelled funny. Oh. There were eight okay. J's on my street, so all the moms made up nicknames. My middle name's Edward. My mom pushed them together, and, and my nickname is Jed, and that's you'll hear Wendy call me Jed. And okay. So I, I'm tone deaf to both. I'll, if you Either one, I'll hear it. So don't, I've been called worse, and so either one of those is great. <laughs> um, so and... Uh, Wendy helps out with the kids. She's a huge blessing here. And uh, how did you meet her? And when did you propose? And all that. Okay, so nice. I'm going to make all the guys in here feel really good when I talk about how <laughs> I proposed. Okay. <coughs> she was working at Abash's, and uh, I found myself kept going through her line, and I, and I <laughs> and I would buy fewer things, so I'd have to go back more days. <laughs> it was right, right after I got out of ASU and I started working, and uh, one day. It was extremely busy, and she was working the cash register where if you're standing in by the frozen foods, you can see all the way th to her register. And there were people everywhere, and I kept, the reason I was doing that, I was waiting until her line got short, and I'd get in her line because I didn't want somebody else to call me over, you know, to be polite. It was very strategic. <laughs> I had to have one thing in my, and <clears throat> so uh, this had gone on for a while, and we had, I think we had talked, um, couple times and so anyway it, this really strange thing happened because I was very shy and well I looked up and she looked at me and smiled and out of my mouth comes she's the one <laughs> <laughs> and I tried to put my hand over to push it back in I was like where did this come from and I'm I'm assuming it was some kind of divine thing because they knew it was like a dope slap you know hey <laughs> <laughs> so so anyway uh, thankfully I, I listened to that um, the way I proposed was <laughs> I wish I could say there was really something cool like doves or something, but uh, a friend of mine uh, worked in a jewelry store, and I said, I'm thinking of getting married. And he said, okay, there'll be a FedEx package at your door tomorrow. And it arrives, and there's like $15,000 worth of loose diamonds in it. He said, just open them one at a time so you don't get them mixed up and call me. And so we went through, and I picked one. I sent it back. He sent the ring. And um, so when I was going to propose, I did ask her father, and – I uh, tried to do it, you know, the right way and everything. But when it came time to propose, I was so nervous. She was sitting in my apartment drinking water, and I go, are you done yet? <laughs> <laughs> and, and I had it in my hand, and my hands are sweating. I'm like, here. <laughs> <laughs> so, so it was – it's not going to be made into a movie at all. But No. Uh -uh. So uh, <laughs> this May, May 14, will be 30 years. Really? All right. Very good. <laughs> Very good. Is that right? 30? Yeah. 30. Good job. Cool. Yeah. Good job. Okay. Jay, Jed, Jedward, whichever one. Okay. <laughs> and that story, it obviously predates Arizona stalking laws, right? Is that the? <laughs> wow. Okay. <laughs> Thank you, Jed. Thank you. Uh, we run out of time. Thanks for coming. <coughs> Ruth, chapter three. Um, Again, great, great book. We're going to get to the romance of this book in chapter three here a little bit and then more next week, but uh, f obviously filled with imagery. You can see why this book, Ruth, was a bestseller in the uh, Israel bestseller list. I mean, people just, uh, there's something for guys and girls here. It's just awesome. There's drama, suspense at every turn, yet God is in complete control. You have that lesson of God in complete control, yet a whole lot of suspense and drama, uh, like I said, every turn. So far, we're in the third act now, chapter three. We've been in the uh, on the road, chapter one. Scene two, we've been uh, in the field. 
And chapter 3 now, at the threshing floor, like Ron said, uh, all of it from the famine, um, famine obviously uh, from the hand of God, disciplining the sin of the nation, the famine, uh, God gets credit for it, uh, famine was one of the many curses that Israel uh, was going to have dumped on her over her history. Uh, all of it, God detailed beforehand. This is just one of the many curses for your sin. Um, I, I, I've been known as a leaky dispensationalist. Anybody know what that is? It's a horrible term. Uh, I'm a dying breed, but here's, here's the basic thing of it, if you have to label uh, me as anything. I don't believe that the uh, promises and blessings in the Old Testament for Israel are for the church today. I, <laughs> I get an amen to that. All right. We're a dying breed. I, I just think the curses, uh, the blessings, it's for Israel, not for the church. It's totally two separate entities. So therefore, I, I don't agree with everything in dispensationalism. So that's why I'm a, a kind of a loose one. Uh, but I'm not a covenant theolo theologian. I'm not a theologian. Can't even say the book of Ruth, right? Um, I just think there's a difference between the church and Israel. And uh, I think that since all the curses came on the nation of Israel, I think all the blessings are going to come on the nation of Israel. Not the church, the blessings. And I think that happens in the millennium period. And uh, so uh, anyway, that's, that's where I'm at, and we'll get into why I'm saying that. But best, back to the best-selling romance novel with a huge touch of a, a suspense thriller, the book of Ruth. Um, there is in this book, especially in this chapter, a drama of God's sovereignty. He is in absolute control. Like I said, from famine to deaths in the family, a cursed foreigner gets saved. She just happens to coincidentally happen upon a close family member's field who showers her with accolades and blessings and gifts and compliments. God is in control. I mean, he's just paving the way while they walk with him in trust. There's also a picture of uh, God's redemption in Boaz, we get a picture of Jesus, and we'll see more of this next week and the week after, but this book gives us a glimpse of Christ's work for us, his bride, and what he did for us to redeem us. There's also a model of Christian marriage. It is a love story, and we will get into that a little bit this morning. In each case, each instance, each character knew and believed God was in control. We call it his sovereignty, his providence. All of them, Naomi, Ruth, Boaz, knew and believed in God's complete control, and yet each of these people did something. And that's the key. None of them just sat back and rested on their laurels. Each of them, believing God, did something. Each person cooperated with God. They worked with God and worked within God's muscles, with his plan, within his will and way, while guided by God, sometimes through circumstances. The whole point is this. They moved they planned, they did something. They didn't just sit around waiting on God to do something. Uh, Ron didn't just sit in his house say, if I'm gonna ever get married someday, God will have to bring someone like Barb to my door. Marry me, right? No, he did something. Stupid, but he did something. <laughs> Jed too, okay. Um, uh, they, see what I mean? God's in control, but they did something. That's the whole point of this, okay? Ruth chapter three, we'll get into it. Let's pray. <clears throat> Father, we ask for your powerful, gentle, healing touch uh, when it comes to uh, continued watching over Dave Cern and Sherry there, um, Russ and Lloyd and Faye, Gary and Liz, Lord, bring healing, Ken and Ron and Suzanne, Lord, continue to watch over her and her uh, cancer and remission, Barb Kruger, we ask that you bring healing, Mary Randall, continue to bring her uh, healing and uh, back to 100%. Lord, we pray for Ray and Lynn Nault, uh, Steve McWilliams, Mindy, Dove LaGrasta, Andy Schaus, Lord, so many others. Tammy, we just ask that you bring healing. Lord, we ask that you bring blessing and abundance to the other churches up and down the street. Lord, the Methodist Church, Baptist Church, Lutheran Church, and Church of Christ, bless them abundantly. And Lord, to our church, we ask that you, since you've blessed us so much, Lord, help us to be a blessing as we leave this place looking like Jesus. Uh, Lord, help us in the mission you have given us. Teach us this morning. Change us, Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. amen.
to uh, live under the curse is, 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 should not be a model for life. Genesis 3, I'm going to read the curses to you again. Uh, this is after the sin, by one man's sin, Adam entered the world, death came, but uh, God disciplined those who were involved in that first sin, m namely uh, the serpent, Adam, and the woman. And here's the curse, I'm just going to read them real quick. The, to the serpent, God said, Cursed are you above all the livestock and all the wild animals. You will crawl on your belly and you will eat dust all the days of your life. And I will put enmity between you and the, and the woman and between your offspring and hers. He will crush your head and you will strike his heel. To the woman, he said, I will greatly increase your pains in childbearing. With pain you will give birth to children. Your desire will be for your husband and he will rule over you. To Adam, he said, because you listened to your wife and ate from the tree about which I commanded you, you must not eat of it. Cursed is the ground because of you. Through painful toil, you will eat of it all the days of your life. It will produce thorns and thistles for you, and you will eat the plants of the field. By the sweat of your brow, you will eat your food until you return to the ground, since from it you were taken. For dust you are, and to dust you will return. Those are the curses. It is not a description of life. It's a description of misery under the curse. And we should not want to live under a curse uh, to Adam and Eve. I mean, a few horrible things here. People think that this is how marriage is and this is how childbearing is. Um, you don't have to live like this. When, it, when a curse is there, seek to overcome. So let's go to each of women. Greatly increase pain in childbirth. It's part of the curse. It came because of the sin. Seek to overcome. Get an epidural, right? <laughs> Come on, use pain meds, something, numb yourself. Uh, it, 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 the other part of it, you're going to want to rule and coerce and fix and repair and change your husband. Seek to overcome. Here you go. D do marriage God's way. Fulfill your role within the relationship of the marriage and the wedding vows. Take your vows seriously. Don't live under the curse. It's a description of misery. It's not a model for marriage. Men are cursed too through Adam. Verse 17, how about that? Cursed is the ground, painful toil, thorns and thistles and weeds, and it, it, your job's going to be horrible. So, well, seek to overcome. Find a job you like, right? We have freedom here. They don't tell you where to go and what to do. Uh, work hard, go to school, get training. You don't have to live under the curse. Find something you enjoy. Uh, the ground's going to be hard. It's going to be difficult for you with weeds and your crops. It's going to be hard. Buy weed, be gone, right? Do something. Seek to overcome. You don't have to live like this. Seek to overcome. Don't live under the curse. Break the cycle of despair. Break the cycle of addiction. Break the cycle of sin. You don't have to live like this. Now, the reason I set this up this way is because Moab, which Ruth is from, that nation, she is under a curse. And it's a horrible curse. I mean, if you look at all the nations that God cursed, uh, Moab has got to be his least favorite. I mean, the, the worst nation, God would say Moab. There's a lot of bad ones, but this one is just horrible. They, they were just east of Israel. Is this east? I don't even know. East, east. East, they were east of Israel. They were cursed by God, uh, in fact, a number of times. They were horrible, disgusting idol worshipers. They were formed, like I told you a couple weeks ago in chapter one, formed by a sinful, incestuous relationship between Lot and his daughter. And let's get dad drunk, and each of the daughters had a kid with them. It's just horrible, horrible way to start. Mo Moab uh, would attack Israel as they would wander through the desert. You know, Israel would skirt by the uh, borders of Moab, and they would attack Israel. Moab, along with the Midianites, hired Balaam, you remember, to curse Israel. Here's some money, curse these people, do something, we hate them so much. God obviously would not curse Israel, so Moab's plan changed. Not the Midianites, but Moab said this, if we can't bring them down with a curse from God, let's seduce them. So they used their women, sexually uh, immorality uh, was ushered into the nation. 24,000 people died because of the Moabite sin into Israel that infected Israel, uh, leading them into adultery and sexual immorality. Uh, later on, Moab, at the time of Judges, oppressed Israel harshly. You can read about that in Judges 2-3 with Ehud, the judge coming to, to play in there. Uh, Moab had this false god called Chemosh. Horrible. Uh, Chemosh was this false god in which they would, to worship this god or appease this god, they would actually burn their kids in the fire. Horrible. Moab was disgusting. So prophet after prophet after prophet would warn Moab they were under God's curse and would soon suffer God's wrath. 
in Deuteronomy 23, after all this stuff is happening, here's what this said. Uh, no Ammonite or Moabite or any of his descendants may enter the assembly of the Lord, even down to the 10th generation. For they did not come to meet you with bread and water on your way out when you came out of Egypt. And they hired Balaam, son of Beor, from Pithor in Aram Nahachurim to pronounce a curse on you. However, the Lord your God would not listen to Balaam, but turn the curse into a blessing for you, because the Lord your God loves you. Uh, and then on and on, do not seek peace or a good relations with them. Uh, on and on. So the curse is there. Tenth generation, it says. Did you hear that? I'm bringing you guys, a tenth generation isn't allowed into the tabernacle or temple later to worship. Uh, some people look at Ruth then and they say, okay, was it 10 generations? Some people actually count out and say, okay, Ruth is actually the 11th generation. So she's free to go in and worship God. Other people think it's just hyperbole, 10th generation, just means a very, very long time. Later, Nehemiah and Nehemiah 13, this is way after the exile, Nehemiah 13, they repeat the curse in Deuteronomy. Where in Deuteronomy they said 10th generation, Nehemiah says this, no Moabite shall ever enter the assembly of God. Now which one's worse, ever or 10th generation? So some people look at the Deuteronomy tw uh, 10th generation and they say it's just, it just means a long time. These people are scum, keep them out of here. No Moabite, no one ever can ever come in to worship. Um, my answer is this, is it 10th generation and Ruth is the 11th, yippee, or is it uh, all of them? My, my answer is this, when you're under a curse, seek to overcome. Break the cycle, halt the contagious pattern of sin, uh, the, the, the conflict between you and God, stop it, stop it. And how do you stop that? The amazing grace of God, that's how. It's the only way, you fall, fall on his mercy. That will stop the cycle. That'll ensure you don't live under the curse. <sighs> Remember, the reason for this is that Ruth was written because the people, they, they, they type out this book, they print it, and they send it out throughout the nation, this wonderful, suspenseful love story because uh, the people were uttering, they, we need a king. We desperately need a king. Uh, remember the request for a king initially broke the heart of God and Samuel. It broke God's heart. So Saul became king, and then they said this, we don't need any king, no. Saul's the wrong guy from the wrong tribe. We need a king, but we need the right king. Right. Book of Judges, Judges, Judges will show you that the wrong tribe is Benjamin, you know, where Saul comes from, but look at how horrible the tribe of Benjamin is. We'll get into that a, a little later. We need a king, but we need the right king. Saul's from the wrong tribe. The right king is David print up this love story, send it out throughout the land, David is the right king. David is the right king. Funny, this, uh, this book is gonna end with the lineage of David. Verse 18, this then is the family line of Perez. Perez they go back to. It's so awesome, that whoever, if Samuel's the one that wrote Ruth, we don't know. Um, if, to start out with Perez, you can see what they're doing. Because we need a king. Well, look at David. He's the right king from the right tribe, and they go all the way back to Perez. We'll get into that in a week or two about how awesome that is. It's just so cute. Why Perez? Oh, so funny. But the, the argument could go this way, though. Okay, if Saul's the wrong king from the wrong tribe, David has some bad lineage, too. Horrible lineage. Uh, it, it's hard to look at David's family tree and not see some disgusting characters in it, like, you know, a Moabite. David has Moabite blood, and the nation of Moab is, you know, disgusting, and they're under a curse. With their sexual immorality, their child sacrifices, yuck. You sure you want David? He's got Moabite blood. So that's what the, the book of Ruth is taking a closer look at David's Moabite relative, his great-grandmother, and especially to including his great-grandfather, who fell in love with the Moabitess. Let's take a look at their love story, their love story. Chapter one, R Ruth broke the cycle. She's in the family line under the nation that came with a curse. She overcame the curse, whether she's the 11th one in a 10 generation curse or whatever, no Moabite ever will worship here. She overcame, she broke the cycle. She halted the contagious nature of sin in her family. How? Chapter one, verse 16. The two women went, uh, 16, I need glasses. Don't urge me to leave you, Ruth said to Naomi, or to turn back from, her, from you. 
Where you go, I will go, and where you stay, I will stay. Your people will be my people. And here you go. Here's her confession of faith, and your God, my God. That's her confession of faith. And the amazing grace of God broke the cycle. The wonderful mercy of God halted the nature, contagious nature of sin in her family. Chemosh is not my false God. Not that disgusting idol. I don't worship there. My God is the God of Israel. He is my God, and she overcame. John the Apostle will ask, who, who, who is it that overcomes the world? How, how can anyone overcome the world? Who are the overcomers? John answers it in 1 John 5, 5. Only they who believe that Jesus is the Son of God. You want to overcome this world and its stain? You want to not live under the curse be an overcomer. And how can you possibly be an overcomer? Revelation says this, and it's kind of tricky language. Only they who overcome won't feel the wrath of God. Well, what do I do to overcome? There's only one thing to do. Believe in Jesus. Believers are overcomers. So if you're cursed, shackled by sin, is your life more of a description of misery than of freedom and joy? Overcome. My goodness, overcome. Believe in Jesus and, and do life his way. It's the whole point of the book of 1 John. Ruth broke the, broke the cycle in her family. She has the gift of faith. She was clinging to Naomi. She marries Boaz, which he was forbidden to do, by the way. If you take the very spirit of the law in Deuteronomy 23, he was forbidden to do it, but he does it. God is in control. Curses were overcome. Cycles were broken. So the three heroes, quickly, in chapter 3. We're going to look at them quickly. Um, in chapter 3, the three heroes, all of them, wi with suspense, all of them are relying on and living under the sovereign will of God. But each, don't miss this please, but each are doing something as well. While God is in control and working out all the details, they're all doing something too. And I think that's what we have to see. They weren't just sitting around idle. The first one, go to the outline. Naomi's plan. Someone wake up, Ian. Okay. <coughs> Naomi's plan. Her plan, the mate. Uh, Naomi is changing. I, I really think she started out bad. If she would have just saw some of the, had the, kind of the eyes of faith in chapter one, she wouldn't have been so bitter. She didn't have to be so bitter. Uh, by chapter two, there is a softening. You could just see it. There is some light that she can see. Remember, a decade of uh, disobedience. Whether it was her disobedience or she just had to follow along while other people made foolish choices, she paid the price. She is bitter. She didn't have to be bitter. Uh, she left God's land with her family. She left God's people, the tabernacle, the customs, the disciplining hand of God under the famine, trying to find food. After 10 years, she comes back bitter. Remember, I left full. Well, if you were so full, why'd you leave? She left full, and I come back empty. She said, and God did this all to me. God's to blame. God did it. She blames God for all this. Uh, the only good thing she had was a glimmering hope of correct theology. And what was her correct theology? God's in control for the good stuff and the bad stuff. So she had that going for her. All these bad things done to me, God's hand. It wasn't her choices or someone else's choice, all God. But as bad and bitter as she was, uh, Ruth saw something about Naomi's God that was intriguing to her. And she clung to Naomi and turned to Naomi's God. Uh, it, it was enough. All she saw, and maybe it wasn't good, maybe it wasn't great, but all she saw in Naomi's God through this bitterness, uh, it was enough for Ruth to come to her God. So uh, Naomi's decade of disobedience t uh, and bitterness, 10 years, remember we said last week, was changed in one day. One day. You could just see the softening, the, the joy just starting to turn, the smile just coming. One day, because Ruth happens to end up in the field of someone who is a close relative, a kinsman redeemer. redeemer. <clears throat> now note, God is in complete control. He controls nature. The fall of even one sparrow doesn't happen without God's power and knowledge. The growth of mildew on a wall, God takes credit for that in Leviticus. I love that. But Naomi, Ruth, Boaz, don't just sit back and do nothing while, while God is on the move. Naomi's plan. Ruth, take a shower and put on your best clothes, please. Okay, I, I like that she told her to take a shower. Uh, later on, we said Ruth worked all day and then in verse 15, this is where she carries the uh, 60 to 80 pounds of uh, barley back to her mother-in-law. So she's a, she's a strong woman. Take a shower, put on your clean clothes, wait till he's drunk. Is that what she's really saying? Look at this. Um, uh, 
Go down to the threshing floor, verse 3, but don't let him know you are there until he has finished eating and drinking. When he's drunk, he'll fall in love with you. No, that's not what's happening there. That's not what's happening. I, I, she says in verse 7, uh, when, when Boaz had finished eating and drinking, he was in good spirits. I don't think that means he was drunk. Here's what I think that means. The famine's over. How many years of famine and not getting enough food, the harvest is coming in, food is overflowing, God is good, life is joyful. I think that's what it means. I don't think he's sitting around drunk and uh, Ruth looks good to him while he's drunk. That's not the case. Basically, in an open area, you remember what the threshing floor was. Uh, you had to separate the chaff from the wheat or the barley. You had to, you know, the big sickles, you had to throw it up in the air and the wind would come by. The good heavy stuff would fall uh, to the ground, the chaff would go up. So he's doing that all day at harvest time. Uh, Boaz sleeps there because he doesn't want anyone to steal it. So Naomi's plan is uh, during the night when he's sleeping, go and lay down at the foot of his bed. Uh, Boaz, just like all the others, were working all day, slept there to protect it. Uh, Naomi's plan, we need to find you a husband. So take a shower, dress nice, go and surprise him in the middle of the night. Again, that is all detailed to the overall lesson. God's in control, but we're going to work with God. We're going to cooperate with him and his will and his plan. I say this all the time, especially to high schoolers. God does not show you a blueprint of your life. God's will means this. You walk the path with him. Here's, here's God's will. You walk the path with him. He's not going to show you 10 days or 10 years ahead. Every step, just walk with God, and he will reveal the path. That is God's will. So they don't just sit back while God is doing all the walking. They're working with him, seeing, discerning, wondering, how is God working? Uh, it's a bold and risky plan. This could backfire. It's risky. What if Boaz isn't interested? What if people see her lying down at the foot of his bed? What does that mean? Is it going to ruin reputations? God is in control. Doesn't mean you don't do anything, Ruth. Trust him. Walk according to his word. Don't disobey any of his word while you're doing this, but go and do something. Don't just sit back and wait for God to drop a husband into your lap. Mm -hmm. Naomi, Ruth, Boaz didn't just sit back. No, they, they took action. They used human ingenuity, God's providence. He superintends. He upholds. He disposes of what he wants, when he wants, how he wants. He leads in all things, in all circumstances, great and small. And in this book, it's sort of hidden. It's kind of shown or done in a low-key way, but it is a theme. Don't just sit back and do nothing because God is in control. Naomi doesn't sit back, nor does Boaz, nor does Ruth. God is in control, but they take energetic human action in the face of that. God directs, God upholds, God governs all creatures and all events by his wise and holy providence. He even governs whose barley field you wander into one day. All of it, God governs. He's in control, but they take a risk. They think of a plan. They set in motion. They devise a way to show Boaz's Ruth, uh, to show Boaz Ruth's interest in him, and he's shocked by it, by the way, Belief in the sovereignty of God doesn't cancel human activity. Do something. Don't disobey. Know his word. Walk with him. In fact, I would say belief in the sovereignty of God invites human activity. It invites it. It, it doesn't stifle it. It stimulates it. Do something. Some think and live, if, if God is directing and God is upholding and God is governing all things from greatest to smallest, uh, and that means, by the way, all nations, it means even a bird in the field, some think, well, why bother doing anything then if he's in complete control? The book of Ruth and I think even Esther show the exact opposite of that. Do something. Walk with God. Discern his will. Naomi believed in this kind of God and yet she arose. He's sovereign. Yet she arose. She devised. She acted. She took a risk. Her plan is, Ruth, let's get you a husband. Ruth says, okay. So Ruth's proposal, here's the date on the night, it's verse 6 through 10. Uh, some interpret what Ruth did. Look at this. Uh, let's read it again. Uh, down at the far end of the grain pile, uh, middle of verse 7, Ruth approached quietly, uncovered his feet, and lay down. In the middle of the night, something startled the man, and he turned and discovered a woman lying at his feet. Some interpret this that Ruth did something sexual. 
Now, and when I was a kid, I started hearing this, and I would read it and say, hmm, it doesn't sound sexual to me. And now I'm an adult, and I got to tell you, it doesn't sound sexual to me. <laughs> it just doesn't. Um, feet. Are you ready for this? Write this down. Feet actually means his feet. <laughs> Who knew? Okay. Um, my translation is this. Verse 7, uncovered his feet. Here's what I think she did. She uncovered his feet. <laughs> Write it down. I'll wait. It's profound. Because uh, some say something sexual was going on here. It was not something sexual. Boaz later wants to avoid the whole appearance of evil and protect reputation, specifically hers. Not, not just his, but hers. Nothing immoral happens here. I mean, I will go to my deathbed saying that. Nothing immoral happens, because some people believe that. Um, I think the Holy Spirit does not hide when biblical characters and heroes do something wrong, right? With the exception of maybe Daniel. Even, some say even Joseph. Joseph laughed, lacked tact sometimes, right? But all other biblical heroes, they show their flaws. Why hide this one? I don't think the Holy Spirit is hiding anything because I don't think they did anything wrong. I think this is a Middle East tradition. This is what Ruth was doing, uh, not trying to hide anything. Boaz is older than her. I think he thinks she is out of her league. Remember I said that last week. What should Ruth do while God is in control? Just wait. Maybe Boaz will come with flowers and a gift and knock on your door someday. Just wait. No. Oh. It's a Middle Eastern tradition, commonplace, and she does what she does in verse 7 because other people were doing it. Translate verse 9. I'm going to translate verse 9 literally. Verse 9 from the Hebrew to the English literally says, spread the corner of your garment over me since you are a kinsman redeemer. That's Hebrew to literal English. Now, here's literal, literal English to Dave's translation. Ruth said, marry me, dummy. <laughs> okay, that's what she is saying there. Spread the corner of your garment over me. Literally, it says spread the, the, spread the corner of your wing over me since you are a kinsman redeemer. She's saying this to Boaz. Will you marry me? Will you marry me? Back in those days, there was no e-harmony. Nothing wrong with that. I actually married a couple of people that found each other e harmony. Some kids in our old youth group in Illinois. Is that a groan? Uh, <laughs> sorry. I married some people. They're happily married. Okay. Um, e -harmony. It's not a support of e harmony. I'm just saying it's done. Uh, my point is, in those days, they didn't have e harmony. If you don't believe me, check it out. Uh, there was no custom in that day for dating. It wasn't like Boaz would show up to her door and say, hey, you want to get to know each other? Can you do dinner? They didn't do that in those days. Parents match made, uh, the, the, were the matchmakers. Got it? Okay. Uh, uh, what if you were older and your parents were dead? How is he possibly going to get with this girl? Naomi says, I got a plan. Take a shower, put on nice clothes, go. He's sleeping in the barley field. Ruth says, marry me. Nothing wrong with that. It's not the custom of today. Maybe, maybe not. I don't, anybody in here proposed to your husband? Uh, you can come up next week. Um, 1982, I met Jill. And I said, wow, she's, she's cute. A little too young, I'm going to wait. Next year, I said, boy, she's even cuter. So the next year, we, we started going out and stuff. In fact, I got, when I first met her, I got off a bus. I used to work at this camp. I went home for a week, came back on a bus. Uh, everyone else kind of ran to get their luggage and stuff. I ran right to the canteen where they sell drinks. I, I was the only one there. I think I had a, uh, a, a cap on my head. I walk in. Um, There's only one person working. And it was a little blonde girl. And, and I said, uh, Get, uh, diet. I don't think they had Diet Coke at the time. Give me Tab or something. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Give me something. And uh, she looked at me, and I could tell she was <laughs> love struck. <laughs> I could tell. I, could tell. I, I said, can I have a Coke or something? And she said, will you marry me? So nothing wrong with people saying that. Nothing wrong. <laughs> no, but what do we do? We, we got to know each other over the years. You remember, I had my tonsils taken out at 17. She had a bunch of friends over. I think I told you this story. She had a bunch of friends over, but uh, she made me just soup because I couldn't eat solid food. Um, she made me soup, and I said, hmm, she can cook. She's cute, the whole thing. So it led over the years, and we got together, and we eventually got married. Ruth can't sit around. In those days, that wasn't the custom. What are you going to do? Boaz thinks this girl's not going to be interested in me. She's a Moabite. Maybe I shouldn't marry her. What should I do? Uh, here's what you do. Ruth, take a shower, put on your best clothes, go sleep at the edge of his bed. He wakes up in the middle of the night. He doesn't kick her out. He's not mad. He said, you know what? There's someone closer than me. Let's keep walking the path, see what God has for us. 
I can't do it just yet. There's someone right in front of me. The chapter ends in suspense. How is it going to end? It's interesting. Look at uh, verse, uh, her proposal again, verse 9. Spread the corner of your, literally that word is wing. The same word is used for wing in chapter 2, verse 12. That's why it's important. Boaz, when he's meeting uh, Ruth in the barley field in, in chapter 2, he says this to her. May you rich, be richly rewarded by the Lord, the God of Israel, under whose wings you have come to take refuge. You're under God's wings. And then Ruth says, put me under your wing. What is she saying to him? Ah, I, you take care of me. Using the same word. You take care of me. You be my husband. Uh, hey, hey, Boaz, dummy, answer your own prayer request. Let God use you. Put feet to the prayers. You be my wing. Hmm. Answer your own prayer. God is in control. But Ruth doesn't sit idly by doing nothing. Walking in the path of God's will, determining, discerning God's next step. Boaz doesn't know. I don't know God's third step from here. I know the next step, there's someone closer, a, a, a closer kinsman redeemer. So here's what we'll do. We'll just wait. And that's what Boaz does. He promises, I will do everything I can in my power. It's kind of out of my hands. God's in control. There's this other guy. The way he does it is just awesome. So verses 11 through 18, we'll get into more. It kind of bridges the gap to chapter four. So we'll show more of Boaz's promise <coughs> next week. Uh, he is the Goel, the kinsman redeemer. But there's someone one step closer. Uh, the suspense says this. Yes, I'm the closest one. And by law, I need to care for you and marry you. I need to buy my relative's land. There's one closer. God's in control. How will it work out? We don't know. Chapter three ends in suspense. The main lesson, I'm gonna do something, Boaz says. Just like Naomi, Naomi said, just like Ruth said, while I wait on God, I'm gonna walk with him, trust him, and do everything in my power to keep walking and taking another step with God. It's the undercurrent in this. Ruth treats her with so much respect here at the end of the chapter. In a world in which men were horrible to women, uh, with the tribe of Benjamin, you gotta see how Judges ends. The tribe of Benjamin, they're so horrible and disgusting, they kill off the whole tribe almost. So then they, they get some women, they said, okay, I can't believe we did this, we can't snuff out a tribe of Israel. So there's like 200 guys left, read it on your own. Um, but th there, there's some guys that need women, they, they can't mix and match all of them. So here's how they devise a plan. Benjamites, those of you who don't have a wife, wait for these girls, they have a party, and the, the, when we blow a whistle or something, grab a woman, carry her away like a stupid caveman, right? Clump them on the head and drag them away by their hair. That's how Judges ends. Boaz is so respectful. He, he's such a gentleman. He says, you know what? I'm not going to do anything here. Don't want it, the appearance of evil. So when it's still dark, go. But I'm going to do everything proper. I'm going to check all the right channels. I'm going to avoid any appearance of evil. Uh, I'm, I'm going to treat you, a woman, with respect. He's a complete gentleman. Far cry from the culture, both then and now. Chapter three ends in suspense. The point is this, though. God is in complete control. Uh, join him in his work. How? Every day is one step with God till he takes the route, turns it, changes it, blockade. You're walking with God. Show me your will. The only way to know God's will is by knowing the heart of the God who makes the will. Fall in love with Jesus. Huh? His will, his way is the best. Let's, let's pray. Father, we thank you for the example and lessons in Ruth. Lord, help us to walk with you. Lord, if there's decisions that need to be made, Lord, we bathe them in prayer. We seek your word. We seek advice. And Lord, we cling to you every step, wondering how you'll lead, how you'll uphold, how you'll sustain, how, you're how you will govern. Lord, we know that the will for us as a people, as a family, as a church even, Lord, uh, they flow from the desire of your heart. Lord, it, it's the expression of love from you to us. But Lord, we're not just going to sit back and do nothing. We move and we work and we cooperate with you.